Okay, and here we go. Morning, uh, DES 570. I am so delighted to be here today with um, our ongoing series of visiting designers. But uh, in fact, our guest this morning is Omar Souza Czech. Uh, I hope I said that correctly. Um, <laughs> who is not a, a visiting um, guest at all because he is San Francisco State's School of Design newest uh, professor of design. So um, I want to welcome you, Omar, to San Francisco, for one, our crazy world right now, and to um, San Francisco State. We're both uh, new professors here. And I'm just so looking forward to hear a little bit about your journey um, as a designer, but from your um, original training at home in Mexico, in Merida, uh, through you just, um, you in fact uh, got a, a BS in computer science, yeah. an undergraduate degree in computer science and worked your way up um, through a PhD uh, in all sorts of interesting things like ex design methods and, and design research at, um, I think it's the University of Indiana, That's Indiana correct. University in Bloomington. Indiana University in Bloomington. So, okay, thank you. So welcome <laughs> and um, I'm sure we're all so dying to hear a little bit about your journey. So I thought I'd just let hand it over to you. You can take us through your journey and, um, and then maybe we can have some questions at the end. So welcome and thanks for being here. No, thank you, Josie. I, I really appreciate that you invited me. Um, so let's see if this works. I'm going to share my screen and okay. Hopefully you're seeing my slides, I hope, right? Yes. Perfect. Um, great. Uh, hi. Um, um, let me see. Technology. Uh, okay. Here I go. Oh, no, it's not working. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is um, Omar Sosatsek. And as Josie said, I was born in Mexico. I was born in Mérida, Yucatan. Um, you know, like, uh, I have, like, uh, as any other Mexican, I have two last names. So... One is like basically um, understood in Spanish. The other one has the Mayan roots. It's part of my Mayan heritage. So it's sick and it's the fifth um, month of one of the two uh, Mayan calendars. And it means school. So I, I, I put on my eye. I learned this semester that, um, that when I came here to the States, you know, I could, you know, just, just choose like, you know, Sosa and that will be like enough. But I didn't want to lose the, you know, my mom's side. And I decided, you know, to keep my second last name, Tsek, the main one, and, you know, hyphenated. So that's why you'll see my name, like, as Sosa hyphen Tsek. And that's what Tsek means. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I was born there. And yeah, and, and I'm not going to, like, tell you the whole dramatic story. But this is, this is a short story. I wanted to be a graphic designer. So when I was in high school, um, I did this test, you know, like to tell you what you're good for. And it turns out that I was good for architecture. But I was like, architecture, I don't want to like, you know, like build houses. Of course, I was quite ignorant about what architecture um, was back then. And to me, it was just about like building houses. And because, you know, Merida, the place I was born, it was pretty small. So I wasn't exposed, you know, like to fascinating architecture as I've been exposed here in the United States, for example. So to me, architecture wasn't an option. And then um, the, uh, the person, you know, in charge of the office told me like, oh, there's a new degree that you can study. It's called graphic design. And I was like, what is that? That was my second year in high school. And it turns out that by that time, I was involved in the student council or student society, as we call it in Spanish. Uh, and I was the illustrator. So for all the events I used to do, you know, they were pretty simple, like kind of like sketchy, but I was fascinated about like and delighted about like doing the illustrations for all the events that we had, all the parties. Because, you know, I used to see, you know, on big, you know, like uh, canvases, you know, like uh, my drawings or like on like folders given to the students or like any promotional, right? So the point is that she told me, oh, graphic design. And I started like seeing, you know, like the, um, the curriculum. And I was like, wow, this is great. I really love this. So I'm <laughs> making this story not short. But the point is that my parents told me, no, you cannot afford it. I mean, we cannot afford it. And, you know, and unlike here, like there, at least back then, 
like 200 years ago. Um, this idea of like having student loans was not common in Mexico. So the other option I had, it was going to the um, school of mathematics because that's the school that was close to my house, to my parents' house. And that was the school I knew because when I was in middle school, turns out that the School of Mathematics was in front of that one. So I knew about, you know, like the facilities and the degree in computer science. So to me, my plan was just like becoming a computer scientist. And then when I discovered graphic design and I learned that I couldn't go to the graphic design school as I planned because it was only a private school, two private schools who offered that degree. And it was pretty expensive for my family. I'm a first generation student. And um, so I decided, well, okay, what's the next thing I can do that I can practice graphic design somehow? And that was like, you know, like getting a degree in computer science. So that's how I ended up like, you know, studying computer science. And while I was in there, um, turns out that I was, you know, like still fascinated by visual design. And I tried, you know, like to take advantage of everything I was learning there in that school. So I started, you know, like getting into um, interface design and web usability. And I was, you know, like crazy about that. And, you know, and to design, you know, the interfaces of software and how they're supposed to work. Um, and of course, there was another like part that I, I really cared about um, which was images like you know like when I used to uh, practice with the earlier versions of Photoshop I was always wondering how do they do that right and that's how I got into image processing you know I was fascinated about all the mathematics behind the algorithms that uh, you know make things possible in Photoshop for example and by the end of my degree my thesis was about um, web simulation of um, some like a, a mathematical model on animal nutrition. And that was the perfect, you know, excuse to combine not only um, what I was expected to do about mathematics and, and modeling, but also, you know, applying my passion about interface design and web design and, and, and software engineering. So that was kind of like the short story. And then I would say, okay, what am I supposed to do now, right? Okay, I want to be a graphic designer. And actually something that I want to say is that Another like, great opportunity I had during um, my undergrad studies is that because I was the graphic design kid, I used to do all the graphic design possible for the school. So if we had a big conference, I was the one like creating the whole corporate identity. If there was a new program, I was the one like creating the brochures. If we had a contest, I was the one creating the image for that contest. So I had so many chances to practice, you know, graphic design somehow informally. And and then I was wondering, okay, what am I supposed to do next, right? And I knew that I wanted to become a professor. That was one, one plan that I wanted, you know, like uh, to follow, to pursue. And, you know, I knew that I had to go to grad school. And I wasn't sure, you know, like uh, if I was going to become a designer, you know, uh, like uh, as a practitioner, but I knew that I wanted to know more about, you know, um, computer science applied to imaging. Uh, and that's when I went to Guanajuato, Mexico. So Guanajuato is um, a city that is like located in what we might consider as the Midwest of Mexico. It's not the Midwest actually, but north side of Mexico City. But you know, it's that area that is kind of like old and kind of like, you know, like a very conservative and, you know, and beautiful as well. Um, so I went to the Center for Research in Mathematics and to pursue a degree in computer science. And I worked on computer vision. So I was like really into the mathematics and the algorithms to process images. And it was great. But during my studies, I was still the kid like doing like web design and corporate identity for my friends, you know, who, um, who, who commissioned, you know, like this type of project. So I was like doing my computer science, like, you know, like projects. And after that, I was like doing my graphic design projects. And that's when I say, okay, like, I really need to do this. And you know, you know, when you feel the call. And I remember the words of one of my friends in Mérida who told me, Omar, if you don't do this, you will not die happy. And I was like, uh, you will be miserable. And I was like, yeah, because I had like this identity divided somehow that I had like, you know, oh, I will become a professor in computer science and go back to the School of Mathematics and, you know, teach there. And, you know, that was kind of the dream 
I had, and on the other side, on the other hand, I had like this dream of becoming, you know, a designer and creating these like great identities and like creating visual messages and that can be seen everywhere or doing web design, right? So I needed to make a decision. So I was very fortunate. And then I applied to a fascinated, you know, like um, um, design graduate program and I got a scholarship. And that's when I moved to um, Puebla, Mexico, that's South Mexico City. And I, I was in this very interesting like a program in information design. And that program was so fascinating because um, we had um, instructors from abroad. So that was my first international experience as a student. Uh, so I had professors from Germany, from um, England, um, and from Canada. Actually, one of the biggest influences I had as a design student was from my professor from Halifax in Canada. Um, he was my, Hanoi Esses, my professor on design rhetoric, and he really changed the way I see design and my interest, um, you know, in design and design research. So I completed this master in information design, and I stayed in Puebla for um, some years, like, um, like working there. So basically, that was my great um, transition or my formal transition from like, you know, like uh, playing with these design ideas and like, you know, like uh, be more, um, not only scholar, but you know, like, a, like, like, you know, like being like more professional as a, as a visual information designer. During my master in information design, I really got into interaction design, interface design, what is called now user experience. It was called differently back then. And I really cared about like um, rhetoric of graphic design. And I also had an amazing opportunity of um, knowing someone, a professor from Brazil, that she founded a school in the sense that she created a theory for human computer interaction. And she had all these researchers and students around her who were working on the applications of this theory. The theory is called semiotic engineering. And it's basically the semiotics of human computer interaction. So to me, like being in that program um, really changed me because you know, when I discovered the um, rhetoric of graphic design plus the semiotics of human computer interaction slash interfaces it was like a poof, my mind like blew and i really you know like say this is what i want to do you know like if i become a professor now so i graduated I, of course after like studying for so many years i said I, okay i really want to do that but honestly i need money and i need a break because that was the, I, I had also did a dream of like, you know, like putting my name out there, you know, among the practitioners. And I stayed in that city for some years and, um, and worked as a freelancer, but also, um, you know, I was like working as an instructor, as a lecturer. And it was so great because uh, one of the, um, the Jesuit university um, in that city, there, um, um, you know, like the San Francisco University, I think, like the Jesuit system is called um, Iberoamericana. So the Universidad Iberoamericana is like, is like well known because it was the first school that opened a graphic design program. That's the one in Mexico City. The branch in Puebla, um, you know, is, a, is, is prestigious somehow. So it's a good school and it's a great environment um, to work as an instructor. And I was very fortunate because I was there when they were about to open the degree in interaction design and digital animation. And I, that's when I went, you know, and asked for a job. And I was the first lecturer working with the first generation in, on the classes of the major. You know, like, a, so all the major like courses, you know, were developed, you know, as we, we went and, you know, as, and I was like, a, I was, a, I was like very involved in defining those classes. So I was basically working with the first generation and defining the first major classes for that degree. So that was a great opportunity.
opportunity. I had like the um, I had the pleasure to teach, you know, like information design, you know, like user centered design, um, information architecture, and human computer interaction to this generation. And at the same time, I was also hired as a lecturer um, in the University of the Americas Puebla where the place where I got my master's degree and that was great because I was also like you know like in a, in a period in which I only had the opportunity to teach for example graphic design software but also there um, there were new classes that emerged like you know like information architecture and I had a chance to you know like to shape it and like teach it for the first time for that that program so I guess I, that was a, yeah I really love teaching you know so but but also had the chance to work as a visual designer, as a, as a communication designer. And I was hired by the library of, um, of this university. I belong to a department called um, Information, Innovation and Information Services. I was the web designer of all the websites of the library um, or the libraries because you know there's like more than one library and there I had a chance to do like information architecture and like web design and interface design um, and also because that was part of my um, of my of my role, I had to do some instructional design, like every semester, basically, you know, the orientation for all the new students about the um, library services that we had on campus, and also like teaching my colleagues about new technology, like blocks. I know that you may laugh about this, but back in the old days, it was a new thing. Um, it, it was it was a great experience, but you know, it was also like kind of like like heavy in the sense that you know like working in the office and then like after hours you know like going teaching one university or the other and I tried to keep to have some like clients you know like uh, so I can practice outside the institutional context so there was a moment in which I had to decide okay I need to make a decision and eventually uh, I decided okay I decided that I would pursue academia and I really wanted to know how if feels to live outside Mexico and like there was a moment in which I found okay so this is kind of this is the story so where I met this Brazilian professor um, was in Cuernavaca Mexico she came with all her students they came to this um, conference on human computer interaction there was a night in which we had a raffle of books from the MIT press and one book was called Thoughtful Interaction Design. And there were like two authors of that book. I Googled them and then I discovered one of them called Eric Stolterman. And Eric Stolterman is a design theorist. And I found that he lives in um, Indiana, in Bloomington, Indiana. And that he, he teaches in this university. And then I discovered the program and I emailed him and I say like, oh, it's like, you know, I cannot tell you if you can like get in, but you, like, why don't you apply? But I wasn't sure and time passed actually sometimes, some years passed. And as I told you, I kept teaching, developing curriculum for these two programs, um, working as, you know, as a freelancer and also working as a visual communication designer for the university. And eventually say, okay, I'm going, I'm going with academia. So that's, that's the next step. I want to become a full-time professor. And, and that's when um, I went back to see, you know, about Indiana, right? And then I decided, okay, I'm going to this program because they say that even though it's an informatics program, you know, um, the track of human computer interaction design is very design oriented. Because one thing that I had for sure is that I want to like solidify, you know, my, my, my designer side. I didn't want to go back, you know, to do mathematics and computer science. I mean, I wanted to do something that relates or is like super connected um, with design. So I applied to Indiana University and I got in and that's when I came to the United States. So I had a fortune of having like two great people, you know, like mentoring me, Marty Siegel, and eventually the one who became my advisor, Eric Stolterman, that guy from the book. Um, and I, that's when I started researching on delightful interfaces. So because during my master's um, studies, you know, the one in information design in Puebla, 
I was focused on the semiotics of interfaces. Then I decided that I wanted, I wanted to explore the other side um, for my doctorate, um, my doctoral studies. Um, so that's when I decided to explore the rhetoric of interfaces. And in order to make it relevant to the field of human-computer interaction, um, I needed uh, to, to see what, what problem we have in HCI that, you know, is relevant. And like, you know, the idea of statics and, you know, an effect um, provoked and in, or induced by computer systems is, is something that, that we carry in that field. And I say, yeah, I mean, I really love, like, you know, well-designed interfaces and well-designed artifacts. And they make me feel like, ah, oh, so what does that mean? And that's when I, you know, oh, that's about the delight they provoke. And that's when I decided to direct um, all my studies on rhetoric of interfaces towards the notion of delight and, and started um, this, you know, like enterprise on, on formulating, you know, what delightful design or what interaction delight um, is. Oh, and, and I graduated. And then I moved to um, uh, to Ann Arbor, Michigan. I worked there for three years as an assistant professor of art and design and professor of information. So it was a great experience. I had um, the opportunity to teach um, you know, several classes, including the Studio 2D, the class of um, about research methods for creative inquiry, um, the information design class, um, the semiotics class, for art and design, and also to, like I had a chance to create my own class, um, you know, on delightful design, and and for some personal stuff because you know it was a great opportunity indeed, but I you know it's like cold, dark, lonely, and and you know and I I needed to I needed a change, so it was a tough decision. But I was telling Josie before we started this interview that I'm very happy with the decision. So like you know in a place where I feel that um, I belong, and you know that I can I can be more myself. I will I will talk about that later. So but after like an hour, I came across this great opportunity. You know here in San Francisco State, I decided to give it a shot and I was I'm pretty fortunate because it works and now I live here. So I'm part now of San Francisco State. I'm hired as the assistant professor of design foundations and this semester um, I'm teaching visual literacy design 323. Um, and that's kind of a journey in academia and like why design and why I care about design. But in general, I really love, you know, like everything that is visual or that is like very visually laden, uh, you know, and I really like, you know, how um, the things, how these artifacts, you know, are composed and I love their aesthetics and I really care about their semiotics and rhetoric. Um, throughout my um, career as a visual designer, I was very into um, corporate identity. Or, or branding, whatever you want to call it right now. Uh, and I guess my biggest project, I think, is that, you know, the one that you can see on the top left corner, the one on orange. So that university, the university I went into, which is a, a, a prime private university in Mexico, in Cholula, Puebla. Uh, so for for things that happened, you know, like to, to the university, the president decided that we needed to change the institutional seal. And I was fortunate to like be part of the team in charge of that change. And, you know, the group of designers, the faculty of the design school and the designers of the design office of the university. And because I was the designer of the library, I sneaked, you know, into that group. So I was pretty fortunate in, and I could, you know, like work in the redesign of the institutional seal. But that was a big lesson because, you know, that's when you learn that um, design is about service and design affects people. And imagine after like 60, 65 generations of um, graduates with this image and brand, you know, that they love, like a random person comes and, you know, like imposes a new one. So it's a big institutional and, you know, cultural shift. 
and you have no idea how much you know like backlash i got it was like it really affected me but now i can see that i'm thankful for that because it really gave me a lesson like, you know like to understand that you know not only about the effects of design but also you know like the relevance of being more sensitive about you know like the needs of a community and the type of design you're creating for that community but anywho, to serve like some of my projects, um, you know, like uh, as I said before, I really love to create not only the logo, but the whole like, you know, like branding aspect of a brand, um, you know, like, a, because that's the opportunity for me to like practice my, you know, like graphic design skills. Um, and while I was working as the designer of the libraries, of course, I had to like develop, you know, like uh, for different um, events in which this library was involved, you know, like uh, like branding stuff or um, besides web, I mean, like, you know, like branding or like uh, or visual communication, you know, like uh, um, related to advertisement or stuff like that. And or even like like simple stuff like illustrations for, you know, like uh, for and internal communication, like sending, you know, like the happy birthday, you know, like uh, messages to the other employees of the library. Um, and, or, you know, announcing, you know, the different events. So that's when I had the chance to practice, you know, like poster design. And, um, but also like in doing more like um, things or projects related to interfaces slash interaction design. Um, for example, in information architecture, for example, when I entered one big project was to change the website. So it was pretty tough because, you know, for my boss, the director, um, it was just a matter of changing the interface. And for me, as a recent graduate of the information design program, it was like a serious matter. So I decided to carry out some like interviews and I'll do an analysis of the content of the website and do a navigation analysis. And that was too much. I was like, why don't you show us the website? Why are you doing this work so much? You know, but, but in the end, I, that's the example you can see on the screen right now, how it was before and how, you know, I transformed it into like a simpler, hopefully, and even more usable, you know, like navigation or navigational structure. And I think it worked because as far as I know, the website hasn't changed that much, um, but maybe they will need like, you know, like to like, you know, but, but anywho, maybe they will need because you cannot stay in that state forever, but, but that requires some work for sure. At least I had a chance, you know, like to work on that and like to create this big change. And so far I think it worked, um, but it was a very interesting project. Um, and I also had to create an, um, different websites for the other libraries. For example, this was, um, this is the website of the um, old books library that this university administrates. But that was my chance to practice, for example, CSE, uh, CSS rules and, you know, and responsive design. So I always, you know, in, what I enjoyed about that work is was that it always gave me the excuse to practice something new about design. And in, in that, you know, like in that way to keep my knowledge updated somehow. So it was pretty cool in that sense. Um, later, when I was in the PhD, I explored a little bit, you know, the next step of information design, which was data visualization and working with algorithms, you know, like uh, in big, you know, chunks of data to see what I can represent visually. So these are some, some examples. Um, and also like this um, interesting project. Um, that I work um, um, during my PhD studies that I, this is a collaborative um, project uh, about the um, human genome. Uh, but also um, one thing that I mention all the time is that I really like to draw. It's not something that I do every day, but especially when I'm stressed or when I ha my mind is so like confused, um, you know, drawing is a way, you know, for me to, reflect and also like metaphorically, you know, like a layout, you know, my concerns or my dreams or stuff like that. And I really like to draw and I really like to do some lettering. Um, so these are some examples of my drawings. And of course, when I can, I try to do something like, you know, more focused and, you know, I really love typography and I really love calligraphy and lettering. So this is like, you know, when I, I you know, I'm idle. So I try, you know, like to do something creative, like, you know, like doing letters or doing some lettering.
And yeah, so that's who I am as a designer, but why do you like, you know, as I said, you know, it was a serendipitous moment in which I discovered that delight is an aspect that I really care about and, you know, related to the aesthetic and semiotics and rhetoric of interfaces. So I decided, you know, to make it my academic career somehow. So what I'm doing basically is, you know, like I study and um, delight from the critical perspective. Um, you know, that's the type of research I do, like critical research on interfaces and services and physical objects. Um, but originally, I started um, from this intersection, um, the intersection of human computer interaction, information design, and visual rhetoric. That thing eventually, or like, is evolved. And now, what I'm trying to um, solidify to make more concrete is, you know, like this notion of design delight, the delight that um, everyday objects, services and experiences, you know, like provoke um, design delight as a conceptual framework. So why delight? Well, because it really shapes the way we feel about the um, about our lives. You know, like it's like when we think about Christmas, you know, when you receive your presents and you're like so delighted or when you're like so overwhelmed, but then like, you know, there's like a, someone comes and give you a hug and then you feel that like everything will become better. Like that, those instances in which we feel like this intense or like significant, you know, like pleasure, they can, they really affect the way we see um, our lives. So basically, as I put here, the delight um, derived from using a man-made artifact affects how people perceive and act upon the everyday life. Um, so my research question basically is how do delightful designs, I'm sorry, there's a typo there, help um, people live a happy and flourishing life? How do you think that we use every day, our computers, our, like, you know, like apps, like the mug I'm using right now, you know, like the, my desk, you know, how do they contribute to like, to, to you know, to, to my life, to make it, you know, like a, a happy and flourishing. So for many years, I've been analyzing existing things, interfaces, objects, services, and I've been using the theory from different fields to like carry out this analysis. And that's how I, I you know, like I started, started shaping, you know, like this notion of design delight. And just to be short, basically at this point and the way I have formulated it, um, at this point, design delight is, um, is something that connects to um, these experiential qualities. So when you are, um, where you are, or you experience engagement, or you experience surprise, or you experience liveliness, or you experience cuteness, serendipity, or reassurance, that can be a, 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 an antece antecedent of delight, one or, the, or a combination of these qualities. So uh, basically, when you are in an experience and you are in the zone and then you have like this like pleasant surprise and you realize that the thing you're using somehow becomes meaningful sometimes because it may look like it's alive and cognizant and at the same time you know that it's inoffensive to you and even you want to take care of it and you know it turns out that what happened at that moment uh, you know it was good for you and you feel that everything is going to be okay that's how I pack all this I pack all these like inequalities into the notion of design delight so and during and while I was in Michigan um, after like formulating the theory or while I was formulating this theory I started some projects um, like uh, about how to play this, you know, in, in a real context. So I had the fortune to ha um, be surrounded of great students. So we were working, you know, with um, some faculty on social work and medicine and see where we, um, where, where we could, uh, you know, like apply these ideas. So we started some explorations. We decided that it was going to be about well-being. And we came up with some like uh, design concepts that needed like further, you know, testing. And that's when I moved here to San Francisco. So that kind of stayed at that level. But we developed some concepts um, based on, you know, ideation, critiques, and research. 
uh, for example, uh, the idea of an interactive bookshelf uh, that you can use to communicate with someone who lives pretty afar, um, you know, or like in case, because that was related to um, the target population that we considered, you know, like people with um, recently diagnosed with HIV, um, that they need, you know, like something to cope with, you know, like the, 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 the news and, the, and, you know, like, and try, you know, like, a, um, you know, they need this behavioral change. They need to, like, you know, like to follow their medication regimen. Um, so, like, you know, what we can, what, what can we create? Uh, so we decided to create this, like, cute um, you know, pill case that with lights, um, with light patterns could communicate with you. Um, and somehow cheer you up and let you know um, whether you were um, following your regimen like uh, properly. And or for example, something kind of random, like you know, like a cookie jar, in which you, in case that you um, had like a tough day, you just go and pick a cookie, you open it, and then you can have like a motivational message that you wrote or probably you know the image of your beloved ones and so you will feel like motivated or you will have quotes from other like you know people um like undergoing the same condition that you have um or even you know like a little um like a little mechanism that allows you you know to um to pick semi-randomly, you know, an activity for you to do, like running or walking or stuff like that. Everything, every time you like had a surprise, um, you you had a cookie, you have that surprise. And then, and also one of the other projects was I interview and student I interviewed um, um, UX designers, and this is an ongoing project actually. Something I need to conclude. Um, so we asked them to redesign a weather app and to but to make it delightful and we're um we got like some responses and some like uh redesigns and now i'm in the analysis phase still but that's another like a uh, approach um, um to my research so delighting teaching design yeah for sure i really love teaching and i i I, I experienced the light so many times. And for example, um, this is like one example of the first year I taught um, officially as a professor of design um, at the University of Michigan. Um, you know, the idea was to create some like posters that raised awareness on campus. So these students, this team, this team, you know, like the, um, like, you know, they were like concerned about sexual harassment and they came up with this like interesting metaphors. Um, like, and I was delighted by the metaphors. It was like, I knew because we were like, you know, doing some critiques and, you know, and some discussion that it was going to be about sexual harassment and, you know, and to protect women. But, and we did some like warm up exercises to create visual metaphors, but the outcome was delightful. I think they, they, for, it was a first semester, you know, like a project. So they nailed, you know, like the concept um, they executed pretty well, right? And, and you know, and it has like, you know, oh, that's just great, you know? And that's why I say, wow. Um, or for example, when I was teaching sign and symbol, the mission in this case was to create a new uh, seasonal, you know, campaign for Starbucks. But the goal was to create a, um, a library of signs. And this student, let's like, say, okay, I'm going, it's about horoscopes. And, and she was a great executor, like a, as a graphic designer. And she came up with this library of signs and she created this, you know, campaign around them. And to see, yeah, I, I, I really love it. And I'm not only hers, I'm, you know, like uh, many of the projects that um, I got from these, um, from these students about, you know, they were like excellent. That was like, a, it was like, I wasn't expecting that. You see, that's where, you know, the, the nice, the positive surprise, you know, and like, you know, I was like really happy that they got something very interesting for their portfolios. Um, the other one, for example, is like when I was teaching information design and I say, okay, we're in a school of art and design. How can we um, introduce or implement art and craft um, into data visualization. 
and I ask them, okay, now we're going to create some like physical data visualizations in which we don't want to be like, you know, algorithmic. We're going to be, we want to be artistic. And for example, on the left side, there was this student who was struggling. Like, you know, I know that I want to like depict interactions with people, but I don't know how. And it was like super cool that when she created this little, you know, like bars and in, in coding like visually, she eventually said, yeah, why I, I can use, you know, the rest of the material um, as a frame or as a base. And she created this two layer type of visualization, the one on the front that shows a particular type of interactions and the one on the back. And also like the other one, the other students that I show on the right side, they were pretty cool because this student who made like this, you know, the different places he lived at. And, you know, and like he used, you know, parts of the, of the packages of the things he used um, to eat in those places as a reference and and you know and like so those plus the thin you know like a translucent paper um like like conveys you know like this idea of like you know like old billboards so it was like super cool and the one on the on the bottom like really impressed me and really delighted me because um she has like you know diabetes and she created this um visualization with ice so what you're seeing is a block of ice in which i have the reading from front to back as a timeline and she has put um she put you know um the things involved at certain different times involved you know like um with that, those moments i mean you know, at, at a certain moment, you know, like when she had to take um, her blood or stuff like that, uh, you know, like she put the objects. So it's like a, it's a physical visual, it's a timeline, but it's made of uh, ice. And of course, the cool thing about this that I never considered is that the visualization can melt down and that's a very interesting phenomenon. And she can update like the visualization, like, you know, like all the time. Or, and this is from my last class in which the mission was to beautify, to make a rock cute. So I gave all students a rock and the idea was to create something interactive or not interactive, a design concept, of course, um, you know, of an object. But the object is supposed to support um, a person in some positive way. So this student in particular, um she had no idea what to do like in the beginning and it's very interesting you know to see how the iteration like uh, really works when it comes to design um and she eventually like made this artifact for a kid um uh, for a kid who's um to like teach kids somehow to talk about their emotions in a non-verbal way so basically you put these beats you know in the little monster and in that way you as a parent you can see you know how your child feels you know at a certain point and you know and based on the beats you can see you know how emotionally laden or like burden or heavy your kid feels like so it was pretty cool so yeah so that's those are some experiences that in which i have experienced delight you know what um you know as, as a professor um, and here in um, some, when here in San Francisco State, of course, I'm looking forward to experiencing the light again, and I'm pretty sure I will. And but why am I here? Well, because of the sense of community. As I said before, I'm a first generation I'm graduate student. Um, as you know, I'm a Latino. I'm an expat. I'm a non-native speaker. Um, I'm also part of the um, LGBT community. So I really feel that in this place, I can be myself without like feeling I'm an outcast or like feeling weird, you know, like a, and you have no idea how, how like feeling that you belong to a community or several communities, like it really, at least this is the way I feel right now after one month living here, that I can move forward instead of being worried all the time that, okay, I know I don't fit, how am I supposed to fit? And because I'm a foodie, I really love for seafood and, you know, sushi. And I have found like great places, like, you know, to eat sushi and sashimi here. And I really love the Latino food I can find here and the whole food in general. So I really like uh, uh, that about, 
I really like like that aspect about living in a big city again, and because this city, you know, I you know I live in um, relatively you know like two big cities in in Mexico in the Mexican Republic, but then when I came here, uh, Puebla is a big city. It's compact like San Francisco, but it has like millions of people in the metropolitan area, so it's pretty chaotic and it's pretty active. And then I came here to the Midwest, right? So to me, it's a cultural shock. You have no idea. So after eight years um, of living in college towns, I also feel, you know, like a nice, you know, like fresh, you know, like a like a breath, you know, like a like breath. I mean, like, you know, like a, of air. Um, I'm not sure if I said that right, but you know, you know, I think you got me, you know, by living in a big city, you know, because design is everywhere. That, you know, I really love to walk, you know, on, you know, market and see the details of the buildings, the opportunity of like going to the Museum of Contemporary Art, the details you can see like everywhere in all the facades, you know, and also you, it's, it's great. We are so surrounded of design here in San Francisco. It's, it, it gives me, at least to me, it gives me so much inspiration. And I really love that because I do believe that in order to develop a visual culture, you need to, you need to be exposed to like great design. Um, but of course, like it's not the same just looking at great design through your skin, a skin screen, um, you know, then and just like being there and experience it yourself in real life. So that I'm really happy about that, uh, you know. And the weather, of course, because as I said, you know, it was tough, like being there in a cold weather, say, okay, I want to like live here forever. Honestly, it was a tough decision. I said, I know, I don't want, I, I don't think I was going to stand snow every year. And in Ann Arbor is beautiful, in Michigan is beautiful in this summer. It's one of the like most gorgeous places I've lived at in the summer. What happens is that it's overcast, you know, for like weeks and days, um, you know, during months, you know, November to March and April. So to me, it was pretty rough. When, it's, when you have a lack of community in a bad weather, it can like undermine your well-being you know, and as a person who studies delight, it makes it tougher. How can you talk about delight if you don't feel delight at all, you know? So that's just part of the decision of coming here. And of course, because living by the ocean, that's, that's a pump, you know, like a, that makes me feel great. It's great to live by the water. Um, and about like working here, because yeah, as I said, you know, like a, I'm so happy that we have two well-defined programs like VSCOM and industrial design. To me, that's great because I know that we can build up, you know, like class after class and we can like focus on what our students, um, you know, we can do. That's amazing. You have no idea that we have like our like concrete programs. And as I said, you know, I, I because I really like, um, I can see a change um, regarding student population. And I, I feel connected, you know, um, with my students. So I feel identified with them. So, so to me, that's important because teaching is not only about just go and talk and talk and talk. There's, some, there's, a, there's an exchange. Maybe you don't see it as a student, but also the professional gets something from you. And that's not necessarily, you know, like the demonstration that you know everything because that's not the case. It's like those little aspects of your personality, your emotions, your affect that you transmit to the professor. That really like affects me. I mean, I mean, I, in, at least in my case. So like that I feel that I can, you know, somehow identify with, with you students of San Francisco State that like brings me joy and you know and I feel yeah I mean I, I was there you know I can it was it was like my experience I wish I can help you you know like uh, to go wherever you want to go that's 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 what really like keeps me like happy about like teaching here and and as I said before I, I'm, I was hired as the this, um, professor of design foundations which means that I will have an active role in shaping you know our programs especially, um, you know, like uh, the foundations, um, the what is considered now the, the you know, the prerequisites prerequisite, um, and, the, and the first classes. Yeah. 
and that's a lot of information but i hope that <laughs> that helped you like you like uh, know a little bit about me and you know and oh. Well, Omar, I, I wanted to say this has been, I've just sat here riveted um, because I really, I, I just appreciate your enthusiasm so much for, um, for what you've built for yourself and then what you're able to now um, give the community in San Francisco and the community at San Francisco State. And I just think it's very, very exciting. Um, and you brought you you mentioned a couple things that we've talked about in our portfolio review class, where I'm really trying to emphasize bringing the different parts of of all of us or each student out that that the personal passions can't be separated really, or or how do you bring your personal passions into your portfolio and be able to communicate that enthusiasm um, for why each of us has chosen you know, to, to take this path into graphic design or UX design or design in general. Um, and for me, I love that you showed your personal, um, your practice that you draw, you know, that's one of our assignments is show me your, your, your practice. Cause we all do something that keeps us going. Um, and, um, and also, the, so the design of delight, I, I, have, I have a couple questions. So number yeah. one, could you just because um, I'm not an academic, although I did get an MFA in the art department. So for me, there's a very natural connection between art and design. It's very, very fluid. And some of the projects you showed of your students were clearly, you know, conceptual art projects as much as design projects, which I love. Right. But could you just explain very quickly what, rhetoric and semiotics, what they mean, because they're oh, kind yeah. of academic terms. And I just think it would be helpful because you were making a clear distinction between them. Yeah, right. And um, yeah, that's a good, very good point because I was assuming. Um, so this is, and this is like a foundational um, for all designers. Yeah. So on one side, we had the elements or the parts um, of our compositions. Each of these parts, you know, create meaning. So basically semiotics is the study of, of science. Science understood in the broad sense are these parts. These parts, you know, like everything is a sign um, from the semiotics perspective. You know, the, um, the, the, the outfit I'm wearing right now, I did it with a certain intention because it conveys a certain meaning. Then we have an, an, an Apple, you know, product instead of a Windows product conveys a different meaning that, you know, that I paint my walls, you know, and with this color conveys a particular meaning. Everything creates meaning. Everything conveys meaning. So, so, so semiotics it's the injection is, of meaning, where the injection of meaning comes. And often it's referred to in terms of words you're looking at language and words but in fact it's expanded out to our entire world which is kind of the design world and those can be visual elements as opposed to language yeah that's correct that's correct and and you we can see we can see that in a very practical sense you know why do you pick those colors? Why do you pick that typography? Why do you pick though that shape? Is there you know like a why do you pick that texture? Because you know that in the end you want to create a certain effect, right? Because it will convey a particular meaning, you know. And rhetoric is basically the the side related to the effect. You know, rhetoric means discourse, but rhetoric also means argumentation. So basically, you create something in order to um, make other people change their beliefs, attitude, and behavior. So, for example, now we can see it in politics, you know, like both Trump and Biden, you know, they say something out because they want to change the perception of the public. But we designers, we do the same. When we create something, we are affecting people's lives. You know, when you do, for example, let's suppose that I create a poster, you know, to support Black Lives Matter. It's because I want the public to change their perception about like Black lives, right? And the same happens, you know, for example, if I create um, 
a shoe that will allow me to walk, you know, for several miles without like hurting my feet, you know, maybe that will induce, you know, some behavioral change, you know, I will become a more active person because of the design of the shoe, you see, so we have two sites that I consider pretty basic, the elements of our designs, you know, convey meaning, and that meaning will have an effect, and that effect can change behavior. So that's why I relate always rhetoric and semiotics. No, no, it's good to it's it's good to to break it down and um and yeah no no, it's, um, no it's it's thank so you for great. that and and I also I love um so I was I was also just thinking about how important right now this whole notion of delight in design is, especially you know I just read again this morning that that. We are in, especially, you know, I, I also feel like you've come to our beautiful city at a time when we're, um, we're not showing our best color. <laughs> it's back <laughs> all orange outside. But um, that we are in a time where people are quite alone and people are addressing issues of depression. And I just heard a report about um, trying to inject conversation or delight into the lives of elderly who are often alone part of the time. And so there's so much relevance, even in the medical community, for your this this importance of delight in our interaction, in our human to human, but also human to object and human to computer interactions. Right. Um, so it's it's very very. And then I thought because I was I I I am deep into this science of seaweed, um, which is this kind of interesting world and in bringing art and science together, or design and science together. But one of the reasons that scientists and myself, we get deep into this um, very specific uh, um, botanical world is the beauty of the seaweeds. And I was just interested that beauty was not necessarily one of your criteria for delight, but it's probably a, a subset and a whole other conversation that we could go off on but there's a certain delight to the study of the seaweeds because of their actions, their interaction with the ocean, um, their, their presentation, their, they're obscured from us most of the time. And that delight, and they're very, very beautiful. And that delight has, is what has driven so many of the scientists that I work with into this very esoteric field. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hear you. And, um, and they come to me and they're so delighted for my work because I explain, I, I, I bring this to light. So they send my books to their parents kind of thing to explain why they've, they've chosen this very <laughs> odd this, this field. No, but I, I, can, I can see it. I, I guess you have a very good point there because, and actually you're the second person who asked me this. So when I, because first beauty is a, research field itself right and also um so that to me implies you know like being um you know to learn about the literature about like the academic literature about like beauty and aesthetics you know and that's a big field i, I kind of like touched it a little bit it's a big field so when i talk about the light i'm assuming that there's some beauty but in your case for example you know, like, uh, so we know about seaweeds and, you know, and we have this sample, but at the moment you transform it into like a large, you know, like a image, you know, for the curtain, you know, that's surprising, you know, like you see it and like, huh, I never considered to see this small thing in this size. It's a nice surprise because I have this, you know, like nice reaction to, you know, that's the type of delight I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and also you can even like think, you know, reassurance because the colors will help not to be that translucent. So people will not see me if they walk into the bathroom by, you know, surprise, you know, or it can be cute, you know, because, you know, like the shapes and the colors, like I convey this idea that it's cute somehow, you see. So instead of talking about beauty, I, I try to like break it down into like other aspects like this is liveliness, cuteness, surprise. But and yeah, from because- my point of view, I often say, well, my my techniques allow these organisms to speak for themselves, like by giving them a larger scale, by stripping away any kind of other context around them. It lets the objects come to life, actually, which is part of your 
your, to make it lively. Make it lively. Um, so I, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Well, Omar, I just, I, there are so many sections to your, your talk that um, pull on themes from, from, um, that we've been talking about in class. And I'm, I'm having each of um, the 570 students write um, um, journal entries in reaction to, to these talks. So I'm hoping that they will make those connections. Um, all of you out there, I hope you will. I hope they're seniors, so um, I'm not sure they'll get to have you as a teacher, which is too bad because obviously you just have, you know, an amazing talent. And I, I really have loved hearing your story of, of figuring out your path and, and, and how important all of these pieces are in terms of the practical design work you've done, but also teaching all along the way and realizing this is something I love. And so this is what I have to do to, to continue this. And um, so yeah. I... No, 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 yeah. I, I, there's something I wanna mention before I forget, oh. actually, and related to this class, pertinent to this class. Um, two things that I didn't mention. One, since I was in computer science, when I said that I wanted to be like a designer and I discovered you know, web design and I started practicing myself, I created a portfolio. To me, having a portfolio, no matter what, is, is crucial. You will not have only one portfolio. You will have several portfolios, but you must start now. Even, I would say even, that's a good point, because I want to say now to my 323 students to have a portfolio now. Even it's simple, you know, like, a, but always have a portfolio, because that really helps you, you know, define who you are as a practitioner, and you start like gaining practice or, you know, on how to present yourself or how to present your process or even, you know, like more like practical stuff. How am I going to showcase a nice photo of my product or what, what elements I want to show off that, you know, like they will be catchy, but not like a misleading reading of it, you know, so you, you, you can keep practicing. And the other thing I didn't mention is that, um, for example, when I was in computer science and I was, you know, besides like doing all the graphic design for these events and the things of the school for free. <laughs> and, uh, and I also had the chance, you know, like to be a humble graphic designer for a dental lab, for example. I, I used to be an instructor of, compu of computer, computing, you know, for um, medical doctors and nurses, but that's a different story. But as a graphic designer, I was like an in-house graphic designer for this dental lab and create catalogs and, you know, about like dental products. And, but, you know, that really helps. So my point is, whatever you can do, especially right now that you're a student, to make you practice, do it do it. I'm not saying that you should like give your work for free, but you, that you should find like projects that will allow you to practice because that's when you're going to learn, you know, like, oh, this is something I don't learn in school because that's the way it is. Like some aspects of human relationships, you know, discussions with a stakeholder, with your boss, or like, you know, constraints related to budget or even the equipment they give you to work with. Those things will occur only in real life context. So always find a project to work on. That's what I'm saying. And always try to have a portfolio. And then you will start discovering, you know, yeah. Exactly. I, well, thank you, yeah. Omar, for re reinforcing that. I, what I'm hoping is, and, and um, many of you students uh, are coming in with portfolios. And as I've said, this portfolio is something that goes on forever. You're, you're constantly rebuilding it and reinventing it. Yeah. And, um, and trying things on for size, I think. Um, we're all trying, trying um, to, we're constantly reinventing ourselves. And especially in, in the early stages, trying a style on and um, then doing as, as you say, as many projects as possible um, to build up that experience. Um, yeah. Work, work, work. So, um, yeah, no, there, again, this is touching on so many themes and I'm so excited to be working with you hopefully in the future to connect your courses to this course. Nice. Um, and um, Omar, just thank you so much. And 
I will certainly be in touch with you going forward. Um, but for the DES 570, maybe they can come back to graduate school or uh, encounter you out in the mission eating a burrito. Um, okay. Like, or if, if there's a particular question or something that you want to talk about, they can drop me a line. Absolutely. Because one of the things um, we have talked about is mentors and how to find mentors. And so your examples um, of, of just Google, oh, that was another when you said, oh, I just saw the author of the book and I Googled them. That's very much uh, an emphasis here is to dig into anything that you find interesting. Um, you never and know where your, it leads you. Your confidence to just write them an email and look where it led you. Um, so, um, and, and finding mentors as well as part of our conversation. So again, thank you so much. Don't go away. I'm just no. gonna stop recording. Uh, okay. And there we go.